Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've been doing a series on reparenting, and over the last few weeks, we've been looking at mental health issues that are one of the most troublesome parts of reparenting. And what I thought I'd do today is kind of end that mental health part on a really practical piece and talk about depression, but from a different angle than I've talked about depression in the past. What we saw through this series is with all the research happening with mental health, it's becoming more and more clear that mental health can have a genetic component, but more and more we're seeing that it's an epigenetic component. It's related to stress. It's related to complex trauma. It, that affects our the energy getting to our brain and throughout our body. And so when we come to deal with depression or anxiety, yes, a pill might help, but more is needed. And that's what I want to talk about today. What is the more that we need to do to reparent ourselves if we have depression? Um, so taking a pill, again, might help, but th there's more that we need to be able to do. And so that is really challenging. So I want to give you 20 things that we need to be looking at if we struggle with depression and come out of complex trauma, things from our complex trauma that might be feeding into our depression without us even realizing it. And so if we were to deal with those things and to, to kind of help grow in those areas, then we wouldn't be struggling with depression as much. And so my journey in dealing with depression has really been that it's a slow process of learning how to heal from, learn tools to manage some of the underlying symptoms that come out of complex trauma. And as I have done that, it has helped the depression stuff overall. And so that's what I want to share with you today and hope it's going to be very practical for you. So just to get us started, a lot of people who come out of severe depression, they don't even think they're in depression unless their depression is a 10 on the 0 to 10 meter. And if it's a 6, 7, or 8, they don't even realize it. And if it's a 3 or 4, it's not even on the radar. Um, and so what we need to be aware of is some of the subtle warning signs that I'm sliding into depression. So here are kind of the common signs that we use to tell whether a person might be sliding into depression and you need an, at least five of these in order to be considered depressed but it's just helpful to be reminded up front of what these signs are so first of all it's like you feel this gravitational pull of being sucked into a black hole and that results in you beginning to lose interest in the things that normally have interested you in the past so you lack motivation to do things in your life. And then when you do stuff, it just doesn't give you the pleasure that it used to give you. It's just like everything is boring. Everything is drudgery. Everything takes effort. You almost feel like a robot at times. Those are signs of depression. For many people, they begin to feel these feelings of worthlessness. They have nothing to offer because they just don't feel like doing anything, and they feel helpless to pull themselves out of this hole. They feel overwhelmed by life. They feel they just can't cope with life. It's, it's just a terrible, terrible feeling. And then there's this antisocial pull feeling that you just don't want to interact with people. You resist social interaction. Social settings create an, a degree of Panic, and that causes you to want to isolate more and more um, from having to deal with people. Then you find yourself very irritable, um, negative, pessimistic about everything, finding fault with everything. It's just a dark place in your head. And then for many people, they see changes in their appetite. Some want to eat all the time. Some don't want to eat at all. Changes in their sleep patterns. Some don't sleep. Some want to sleep all the time. Changes in their weight. Um, 
Some start to go through experiencing physical pain, um, overwhelming fatigue, having trouble concentrating, even they start to lose short-term memory stuff. So those are symptoms of depression. And so it's helpful to be aware of them that you might be sliding into depression if those things are starting to happen. And so the response to me is just to begin to monitor that. What's happening here? I don't want to jump to conclusions. I won't, don't want to get down on myself or panic. I just want to start keeping track of what's going on inside of me. So let's go to the 20 things that come out of complex trauma that can feed into depression, but that I can help, I can stop, I can manage better and better. So the first one is an overworked sympathetic nervous system. So what we have seen in the teaching about complex trauma is we're created with this central nervous system that has two parts. Uh, a sympathetic nervous system and a parasympathetic nervous system, and they're designed to work in balance. So the sympathetic nervous system is all about output, productivity, energy, survival. The parasympathetic is all about rest, rejuvenation, repair of the, of the system. So what happens in complex trauma is that gets out of balance because you're in danger, so your sympathetic nervous system is working all the time and your parasympathetic doesn't have a chance to come in and rest and rejuvenate and repair. The other thing that can happen is if you're in a heightened state of stress, maybe not feeling in danger, but you're in a heightened state of stress, then your sympathetic is working more than it should. Or the other thing that can happen is if you grew up where you were made to feel guilty for relaxing, for taking care of yourself, for resting too much, and you have this work ethic that just go, go, go drivenness, then it's out of balance. You can tolerate that when you're young for a period of time, but after a while, you'll burn out. And one of the things that the body does to try to help restore the balance to get the parasympathetic nervous system working is brings on depression because that begins to make me want to shut down and rest and restore. So depression for people who've been out of balance with their sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, depression is actually a way to try to help them not burn themselves out, not destroy themselves. So for many people with depression that come out of complex trauma, one of the things that you need to be aware of is it's very possible that your sympathetic nervous system has been working too much and your parasympathetic not enough and your depression is a tool that your body uses to try to help you not burn out. So if you're sliding into depression, you need to begin to stop yourself and go, okay, is my sympathetic going too much right now? Maybe this depression is trying to tell me to slow down to get back into balance. And it's actually a wonderful, positive, life-saving thing. So what are the characteristics of people that get it out of balance very easily? They don't deal well with stress. They push themselves when they should be resting. They push themselves when they're exhausted. They tend to disconnect from their emotions and being aware of what's going on in their body and they lose track of how they're doing deep down, how they're feeling deep down. And so if those are the characteristics of a person, they're going to easily get out of balance and then depression will kick in. So what does this person have to learn? They have to learn a balanced lifestyle balance between their sympathetic and parasympathetic, and that is not easy to learn. That involves learning good health care, getting adequate sleep, exercise, food, paying attention to the early warning signs of fatigue, being mindful of your emotional state many times a day knowing the early warning signs that your emotional state is sliding to a negative place. 
Another piece just to add to all of this is if your sympathetic nervous system is going all the time, then your brain will be releasing cortisol, which gets your adrenaline system going. And so when that happens and you have too much cortisol and adrenaline, depression often follows. So just again, be aware that depression is tied to the cortisol adrenaline stuff when it's overworked. The second cause of thing that feeds depression is if you're angry at yourself all the time, that's going to feed into depression. So there's really two causes of anger itself. So number one is guilt and number two is shame. So guilt is I've done something I know is wrong that has hurt other people and I just can't forgive myself. I can't let it go. I feel the need to beat myself up. I don't feel I deserve a good life because of what I've done. And so I'm just angry and I'm putting myself down, punishing myself. That can lead to depression. And then shame is I don't accept all the parts of myself. I, I think I don't matter. I don't, people don't want a relationship with me. Somehow I'm unlovable. I'm not valuable. I'm a loser. I'm not good enough. That's that core identity that's negative that we call shame. And so what you can begin to realize is if a person lives with unresolved guilt and unresolved shame, both you don't like yourself. You hate yourself. You feel all alone in the world. You feel nobody else likes you. You feel nobody else wants a relationship with you. That feeds depression. And I would say that, in my mind, shame feeds depression more than anything. It's the least detected. Most people aren't even aware of it. But when they become aware of it, they go, wow, that is constantly feeding my depression because I don't like myself. I don't want to connect with myself. I don't think anybody else likes me. I feel not good enough. I feel a failure. I feel all alone. That is super depressing. And so to deal with your depression, it's absolutely essential to begin healing shame and to resolve your guilt. Those become so important. The third one that feeds into depression is whenever we suppress emotions. So instead of letting ourselves express emotions and feel emotions, we push down very intense emotions like anger, like grief, like fear and anxiety. And we push it down to try to act like it doesn't bother us. We're not affected by this. That takes a ton of emotional energy to hold down those emotions. It's like trying to hold a beach ball under the water for a long period of time. It takes a lot of energy and it begins to wear us out. And when we begin to get worn out emotionally, that's when depression can kick in. So if you're suppressing emotions, not allowing yourself to feel what you're actually feeling, then that could lead to depression. The fourth one is when we have lack of connection. Now, it's important to talk about this one because I think for many people that come out of complex trauma, they don't think of this one. And I think the reason is because when we come out of complex trauma and we now have depression, the pull of depression is I don't want people. People add to my pain. People are too hard to deal with. So isolating feels like it's actually going to help my depression. Not connecting with people is going to make my life easier. And so we begin to think, okay, the solution to all that I'm feeling is just don't deal with people. Don't connect. When the opposite is actually true. So think of it this way. What happens to a child when they connect? They feel love. They feel part of. They feel a sense of value. And that releases oxytocin in the brain, serotonin in the brain, dopamine in the brain, all the good chemicals that give the feelings of good emotions. 
But what happens when a child can't connect? So they go to mom or dad or, or somebody significant to them. They want to share. They want to be authentic. They want to open up and talk about their life. And nobody wants to connect with them. What happens inside of them? Well, they feel it must be my fault. So I must be unlovable. I must not be good enough. I must not have value. Nobody wants me. They feel rejected. They feel abandoned. They feel all alone. They don't have one good chemical. It feeds shame. And so it feeds depression. And so what is so important to realize is if we struggle with depression today, we need to fight the pull of isolation and connect with safe people. And in connecting with safe people and being able to talk at a deep level very openly and honestly, that releases chemicals that help fight that depression. So connection becomes such an important tool in learning to manage depression, but it's a super hard tool to implement because it's the last thing we feel like doing. The next one, it's important to realize that depression can be affected by my belief system, what I'm believing about myself, about life. So if it's based on lies, then that could lead to depression. So I need to be aware of the lies I'm believing that are feeding into depression. So let me just give you some of the lies. The shame lie that says nobody wants to connect with me or anybody who gets to know me is going to reject me or abandon me. Or I only have value if I perform and please people. All of my value comes from my external world, my accomplishments, my position, not from who I am. If I set boundaries with people and say no, then I'm being selfish or unloving. If I take care of myself, I'm being selfish, lazy, unloving. In order for people to like me, I must be perfect. Or I must give up my needs. In other words, I must become smaller. And if I fail, I'm a failure. I hope you can see that if you believe any of those lies, you're feeding into depression. And so what you're really having to realize is those lies exist when my limbic brain gets triggered and those lies come out. So I have to get back to my cortex and remind myself of the truth about myself, about life, and that will help me fight depression. The next one, and this one's tricky, but it's people can get stuck in the grief process. So let, let me explain why it's tricky. We know that the grieving process includes a time of deep sadness, deep mourning, and that in some cases that can go on for a year, two years, and that's just the healthy part of the grieving process. And so it'd be wrong to say, oh, you've been grieving for two months, you're stuck because you're still sad. No, it can go on and on and on, and that can be very healthy. But what I have seen is that for some people, once they get through that grieving process to when it naturally should be moving on to acceptance, they get stuck. They can't let go. And, and I think there's several reasons why they can't let go. So the one can be they just, they're still, they feel guilt about that loss. If I had done something differently, I wouldn't have lost that. It's my fault. And so there's still guilt that's keeping them from letting go. They haven't forgiven themselves. Or secondly, there's a, attachment issues, codependency issues. So they've never been able to connect well with people. And so now when they've had this connection and lost it, they just can't let go of that connection. And so that can be, be a significant issue. And then for some people, there's, if I stop grieving and get happy and enjoy life again, 
they feel that that's wrong, that that's saying they don't miss that person. And so they just have trouble letting go. So what I hope you can realize is if you get to that point when you should be letting go, it doesn't mean you forget about them, doesn't mean you don't care about them, but you're able to let go and move on with life, but you don't, what you're actually doing is continuing to feed into that, I got to be sad, I got to be down, and it feeds into depression. So for this one, I would really encourage you to be able to talk to a, a therapist who knows about this stuff, who can just help you process if the s- sadness that you're in for grieving is a healthy part of the grieving process, or maybe you might be stuck and it's feeding into depression. The next one, and this happens for many people in complex trauma without them even realizing it. And that's when we're going through life, and usually life is made up of lots of good things happening and some problems that we got to deal with. What can begin to happen is that the problems that we got to deal with start to outweigh the good things that are happening. And so life becomes more frustrating and difficult and hard and painful than it is fun and enjoyable. And if that is out of balance and we just have too many problems, it starts to take its toll and life gets hard, we don't like it anymore, and it gets depressing. But the problem for many people from complex trauma is they bring some of these problems on themselves. Or they're in problems, they could resolve them, but they don't. And so they don't resolve the problems because they're lazy, they procrastinate, it's just too hard, they just go to avoid, avoid. Or whenever they're in a problem, they just go blame somebody and don't accept responsibility for it, never own their part. And so as a result, they just keep adding more and more stress and weight to their life until it takes its toll, and then that just feeds into depression. The other part is that sometimes with problems, we can't resolve them right away. we got to sit in them for a while. Because we've got, got a new job coming up and we're feeling some anxiety, but we can't speed up the start date. We just got to wait for that start date to happen. So we just got to sit in that anxiety. But if we don't know what to do with that, then we can actually start to do things that feed the anxiety and make it worse. And then that all starts to feed into depression. And so it's really learning how to resolve resolvable problems and how to sit in problems that we just have to sit in that can't be resolved and manage our feelings and manage our emotions. If we don't, it feeds into depression. The next one, this one is so important because so many people do it. That is getting into a relationship with a narcissistic gaslighter. Lindsay Gibson has written a book called Self-Care for Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. And in it, she says, all people have to do to bring you down is follow a simple three-part recipe. Number one, listen to your ideas or desires, then offer helpful criticism. Two, push you to accept their much better idea. And three, when you protest and get upset, tell you to calm down and explain in a slow, rational voice why their way makes much more sense. That is basically gaslight. And I would say that for many people with complex trauma, they have been in a relationship with parents or a partner or another authority figure who's a gaslighter. And so gaslighting basically is, it's a very subtle, powerful strategy to control people. And what it basically does is you get the person to question their own thinking, to question their own perception of reality. So let's say you say something and the gaslighter goes, huh, I don't think you're seeing that right. Or, no, that's stupid. And you start to question yourself. Over a period of time, they begin to wear you down. So you 
doubt your own thinking, you doubt your own perception more and more and more. But the goal is, is that you will start to trust their perception and their thinking so that eventually their perception and their thinking will control you. You will just adopt it. And that is the ultimate of control. But what also happens with that is as you're doubting yourself, as you're giving more power to them to control your the perception and the thinking, is your shame is deepening. They're tearing you down. They're making you feel stupid. They're making you feel you can't think anything through correctly. You don't see things correctly. You're a total loser. You need them totally 100% to run your life for you because you are a loser. That is abuse. That is the ultimate, gradual, subtle way to lead to totally controlling another person. So for many people in recovery, they come out of that. But then they go back into relationships where they're with somebody that starts gaslighting them again. And it starts triggering all that shame. I can't think for myself, I'm stupid. Guess what that does? It feeds depression. So if you're with a gaslighter, it will feed depression. So that leads to the next one. And that is spending time with people, not necessarily who are gaslighters, but people who put you down all the time. Subtle ways, you know, in overt ways. So they might criticize you. They might do little passive aggressive shots at you, sarcasm, little things that make you feel stupid, make you feel you're not good enough. They may want you to listen to them, but they don't listen to you very well. They may use body language or size or raising eyebrows that just make them go like, who are you? You're stupid. Always little things to put you down. Your decisions are never good enough. They always got to correct you. If you hang around people like that, you're going to walk away feeling depressed. You're going to walk away feeling bad about yourself. And so a big part of fighting against depression often is setting boundaries with people who don't appreciate you. Boundaries with people who put you down. But let me take that further. It's easy to say, stop doing that, but that's hard for many to implement. So if a person is going to set boundaries with people who don't appreciate them, people that put them down, what skills, what do they need, where do they need to be at? So number one, you have to deal with your shame to the point where you're able to say, I matter. My needs are just as important to them. I am just as valuable as them. So it is all right for me to stand up for myself and express my needs. And it's also all right for me to stand up for myself and require that people treat me with respect. And if they don't, then they don't get a relationship with me. So that requires some healing of shame to happen. So you get a backbone to stand up for yourself. But that is important. Secondly, it's realizing I don't need toxic people. I don't need to keep going to them for validation, for trying to get them to love me. I can do just fine without toxic people. And so I can cut them out of my life totally, or I can just set boundaries and spend less time with those kind of people. That's okay. But then to be able to do that, I have to be able to be alone for a while. And some of you, some struggle with that. But then I also have to create a surrogate family, a support network of safe friends, people that do appreciate me. And so I have to be setting boundaries with more toxic people, but creating new friendships. Both are necessary. So that is challenging, but so important in recovery. And if we're going to fight depression stuff. The next one, not falling the victim mode. So what happens for many from complex trauma is whenever they end up with kind of a big problem that just feels overwhelming, immediately it triggers 
that little child in them that feels helpless. I can't resolve this. And so they go from feeling helpless to this is hopeless right away. And so as a child, they didn't have the tools or the support to handle that. And so that's why it was, they were helpless and it became hopeless. But now today they might have tools and they might have support. But when that gets triggered, it just, they go back to feeling what that little child felt. And so that can happen without even realizing. And it happens for so many people. So it's important that when you're facing a problem to validate, well, this is hard. This, I feel kind of overwhelmed by this. Well, let's get back to my cortex and let's get this sorted out because I do have tools and I do have resources I can talk to and get them to help me. And then you work through it. But if you don't catch that and you go into this, I'm, this is hopeless, then you begin to feel sorry for yourself. Then you have your own pity party. That feeds depression. So really watch out for when you slide into victim mode because that is a dangerous place that feeds depression. The next one, not being honest about how you're doing. Not being honest about the current situations in your life, about your own emotions. What happens for a lot of people in complex trauma is they're told, get over it. And so they push it down and they put on a brave face. They put on a happy face. They go, yeah, I'm doing really good. They try to have a positive attitude. But a lot of their life became denying what they're feeling, disconnecting from what they're feeling. And they think that was good. And denying all of that painful stuff and just being positive worked, but did it. You see, whenever I push down emotions and I deny emotions and I deny reality, it doesn't mean it changes reality. Reality is still there. And my brain and nervous system, a part of it has to deal with that reality. Even though I'm denying it in another part of my brain, and even though I'm suppressing those emotions, it's still affecting me. And it's affecting me in a negative way, and it's taking its toll on my central nervous system. And so what happens for people with denial as their way of coping and putting positive spin on everything is it seems to work for a little while, but eventually it takes its toll. And that feeds into depression. And so again, it's so important to be able to be honest with myself about how I'm doing, about how my life is, so that I can honestly face the situations, deal with them and resolve them. That then releases the pressure, and that's a positive thing. But to deny it and suppress it feeds into depression. Number 12, ongoing anxiety. This is, again, a common occurrence for many people with complex trauma. You deal with anxiety all the time. But what's important to realize is that when we are feeling anxiety, it activates our sympathetic nervous system. It activates our stress system. And so as a result of that, we can get out of balance again. And our sympathetic nervous system is going all the time, our parasympathetic isn't allowed to rest and rejuvenate and heal. And before you know it, we're starting to burn out and then depression comes in to try to rescue us. So be very aware of the anxiety stuff. So for a lot of people, identify, or managing their anxiety kind of involves two important things. Number one, identifying any lies that they believe that are feeding into their anxiety. And number two, learning to regulate their emotions, learning what to do physically when they're feeling anxiety that helps calm them down, that helps ground them. That becomes a very important piece for them. So again, if they don't, they end up feeding into depression. Now, now very quickly, let me give you just a few other things that come out of complex trauma that feed into depression. Number one, if you people please. So you people please, 
But what you begin to realize as you get on in adult life is you can't please everybody. That will then feed into depression. So people pleasing seems to work for a while because you get people to like you, but then you begin to realize this is starting to backfire because I can't get everybody to like me, and that feeds into depression. Secondly, perfectionism. Again, that seemed to work for a little while. I, I did really well. I excelled. I excelled, I excelled. Then I began to realize this is backfiring because I can't do everything perfectly. And so now I get down on myself all the time because everything's not perfect. And that feeds into depression. So to deal with depression, you got to deal with your people-pleasing tendencies and you got to deal with perfectionist tendencies. The next one, control. So part of what comes out of complex trauma is the only way to get my needs met is if I control everything. And that seems to work for a while, but then you begin to realize this is backfiring because I can't control everything and everybody. And so I'm not getting my needs met the way I want and just getting me very angry. And that feeds into depression. So you got to deal with control issues if you want to help with your depression issues. Next one, manipulation. Again, coming out of complex trauma is if I can't control everybody through kind of intimidation, then I need to manipulate people to meet my needs. And I need to be sneaky and I need to kind of have hidden agendas and get people to do what I want through all kinds of different tactics. And that seems to work for a while until you begin to realize nobody trusts me anymore. They figured out that I'm a manipulator and they don't want to be around me. And so all of a sudden, your relationships are falling apart. People don't like you, don't want to be around you. That feeds into depression. So you've got to deal with manipulation if you want to deal with depression. Next one, for many people coming out of complex trauma, their life was all about looking for danger. And so they became very focused on negative, critical. And so they are very good at finding fault with everything. But that feeds depression. And so part of dealing with depression is you've got to begin to change that mental orientation of always focusing on negative, critical stuff. Another thing that comes out of complex trauma that feeds into depression is disconnecting from self. So a child couldn't resolve their internal world of pain because nobody was helping them. People were just adding to the pain. So they just said, the only solution is to disconnect from myself. It's That became their normal, their default setting. And so now today, it's very easy to slide back into disconnecting from yourself without even realizing it. So you think you're kind of aware of yourself, but really you're only aware of your most prominent emotions. You lose touch with how you're really doing deep inside. And what begins to happen when you disconnect from yourself is life feels boring. Life feels empty because you're not feeling your emotions fully. And so when life feels boring, life feels empty, what's that going to feed into? Life sucks. Depression. And so you have to deal with that tendency to disconnect from yourself. Next thing that comes out of complex trauma for many is they judge themselves harshly. They have a very strong internal critic. So no matter what they do, they find fault with themselves and put themselves down. They criticize themselves. And it's an endless voice in their head that's constantly yipping at them. That feeds depression. So you have to be working on dealing with that inner critic. Okay, the final one, ways of responding to trauma, fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. Flight and freeze basically are shut down, avoid. Avoid, the way to not get hurt is to avoid problems, avoid conflict, avoid angry people. And so avoidance becomes their way of dealing with life. It's easy to slip back into that without even realizing it. And when you slip back into a void, what you're basically doing is not resolving anything, not dealing with anything, so it starts piling up. And as it piles up, your stress system is activated, your sympathetic nervous system is activated, and it all starts feeding into depression. 
And so part of dealing with depression is not avoiding life, but facing life and resolving the situations that come up. So that's a lot of very practical things that feed into depression that we can begin to work on. And I hope that helps you. I know it's helped me a lot in my life to learn these things. But let me remind you again, it's a long, slow process to implement all of the tools necessary to deal with these things. So I just wish you the best in your journey dealing with depression stuff. Well, that's the end of our Friday night. Thank you for being here. Hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you next time. Well, welcome back. Last time I said I want to talk for a couple of weeks about some of the statements you hear from Christians that are packed with meanings and assumptions and they sound great, but when you stop and analyze them, you go, oh, I'm not sure all of that is really true. But often the people that say those things aren't even aware of a lot of the assumptions that are part of what they're saying. They just think they're saying an obvious thing that's only true. And so I've wanted to unpack some of the assumptions that people are making. So here's the example today. You're, let's say you're having a conversation with a Christian about an issue and there's a disagreement and you bring in all of the latest research, all of the thinking that you've gone through and you present a very cogent case as to why you think your view is correct. Their response is, I don't care about all that stuff that you said. This is what the Bible says. The Bible is true. I believe it. That settles it. End of discussion. And so if the Bible says this is the truth, then it is the truth. And so that sounds good. It seems like what the person is saying, that if the Bible is the highest source of truth, then if the Bible says it, then that's the truth. Anything that disagrees with it is wrong, regardless of what they think might make it the tr right. What people are assuming is what they're being told the Bible says is the truth is actually what the Bible says. And that is a huge issue. And so a lot of people are coming around today going, the Bible says this is the truth, therefore everything that is discovered in science, everything that other people are saying and the other opinions are wrong. I'm not open for any consideration of those opinions. God said it. I believe it. That settles it for me. And I'm not even going to consider another option. My mind is closed to that because I must be faithful to the truth. That can be very frustrating to deal with. Now, if you've dealt with somebody like that, and you tried to say, whoa, maybe you've been brainwashed, maybe that's not what the Bible says, and you, out of concern and love, try to help them see that, often how they interpret that is, other people are calling me crazy, other people are saying I'm brainwashed, I'm just being persecuted for my faith. That's what God said would happen when you stand up for truth, is you will get persecuted, so I actually feel good about myself. I'm doing the right thing. And I shouldn't listen to these people. And so their response to me just shows how far they've drifted from God and I'm the one being true to God. And so you begin to realize, wow, you can't even argue with them. You can't have a discussion. They have a way of taking whatever you say and bring it to a point where I'm right and this just proves that I'm right, that I'm getting opposition. And they are so far from God's truth. So if you've dealt with that or you're in this situation now, let me just try to help you process through some of that. Do you realize that the Bible says all kinds of things that we don't agree with or do today? 
So the Bible says that we are to greet one another with a holy kiss. I don't see many people doing that. But the Bible says we should do it. So what's, why don't we do it? If the Bible says it. The Bible says, literally, black and white, women should not speak in church. But we have women speak in church. The Bible says that women should actually wear a covering over their head in church. That hasn't happened very often. The Bible says things that seem to support slavery. The Bible presents God as encouraging genocide. The Bible says we should stone adulterers. The Bible says we shouldn't eat pork. So there's a bunch of different things that the Bible says that we go, no, 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 we don't have to do that today. But Okay, so you've just made a distinction in your mind that if the Bible says it, doesn't necessarily mean I have to do it or believe it. But you haven't looked at why some things you think you have to do and some things you don't have to do. That's what we're get, getting at. Okay, the next thing. What is so important to understand is the Bible was written two to 5,000 years ago. So it's written over a lot of number of years from ancient cultures, ancient understandings of the world, ancient perspectives. That was put in a book, and now what you're being told the Bible says is somebody's interpretation of what was said for three, two thousand years ago. They're trying to interpret the culture, the mindset, the perspective, what was happening in history, and tell you what they think the Bible is saying. But it's going through quite a few filters to get to that. And so understand what you're hearing is not necessarily what the Bible says. What you're hearing is somebody's interpretation of what the Bible says. Next thing. If you look at Christianity, what you end up discovering is there's hundreds of different interpretations. There's hundreds of different opinions about what the Bible says. If you look at baptism, all kinds of different interpretations about baptism. It's just disagreement after disagreement about what the Bible says. And so it's not like there's one agreed upon interpretation that every Christian has adopted about what the Bible says. There's hundreds of different interpretations. In other words, it's not easy to get to a clear understanding of what was meant 4,000 years ago when that person wrote that. So keep that in mind. So if you look at every major Christian topic, what you're going to find is that there's all kinds of disagreement amongst godly people, godly scholars. I'm not talking about people who don't care. I'm not talking about people who are obviously just very bad. I'm talking about godly people who want to please God disagree about heaven, about hell, about patriarchy, about divorce, about marriage, about spiritual gifts like tongues, about future, about poverty, about alcohol, about sex, about salvation, about how churches should operate. Opinion after opinion after opinion after opinion, no agreement. So it's not as simple as the Bible says it, so I have to do it. It's way more complicated than that. Now let me take it from another perspective. What has been presented in many churches is the Bible's the only source of truth. But have you ever stopped to think about truth is truth is truth is truth, no matter where you find it? Truth can go beyond the Bible. You don't go to your doctor if you have cancer and say, have you been trained by the Bible? Do you only follow what the Bible says about cancer? 
because that's the only doctor I'm going to see is you have to follow what the Bible says about cancer. No, you go, no, there's truth outside of the Bible about cancer. The Bible wasn't designed to be a cancer textbook. When you go to get your car repaired, you don't say to the mechanic, are you going to repair my car according to the Bible? Because I only believe truth is found in the Bible. No, you go, no, there's truth about mechanics, about how cars operate outside of the Bible. That wasn't the purpose of the Bible. And you can even think of marriage and raising children. The Bible speaks to some principles about that. But we go outside of that to modern psychology about what we're learning about raising children, about what makes healthy marriages. So truth is outside of. Truth is truth is truth, no matter where you find it. I don't teach my child to tie their shoes or ride a bike by bringing a Bible to them. I bring truth from other areas. So put that into your mind. Don't fall into thinking that the Bible should be seen as the final word on all subjects. To me, that leads to a bunch of problems for people. Now, there's another thing that is so important to understand. Truth, if it's truly true, it can withstand careful examination. It can be subjected to great scrutiny and it can withstand it because it's truth. It's not afraid of being challenged. It's not afraid of questions. If you're in a system where you are not allowed to challenge stuff that supposedly is the truth and there's a fear of challenging things, that to me, something's not right there. Because they should welcome questions. They should welcome challenges. So, the next thing. As you look back over history, what you find is that Christians have changed their minds about what they thought the Bible said on many, many subjects. So, they used to think the earth was flat. Science kind of changed that. Now they look at the Bible differently around that. They used to have thoughts around slavery and they thought the Bible supported it and then things have happened and now they don't think the Bible supports it the role of women patriarchy there used to be thoughts around that that they thought the Bible supported now it's not don't think that's happening hundreds of different areas where Christians have held one view and then begun to no I think that's wrong and have changed their mind so the bottom line is We want to follow truth wherever it takes us. And if it seems at first it's going to go against the Bible, wait long enough, keep studying, and you're going to find out there's probably agreement. We just had interpreted it incorrectly before. So, most scholars today say we need a guiding principle when it comes to to interpreting the Bible. Every possible interpretation needs to be subjected to this guiding principle, and if it matches it, then we can say maybe it's true, but if it contradicts it, then we go, it's obviously wrong. What's that guiding principle? Love. Treat everybody as equals. And so if I end up with a system that says women are inferior to men, women have less rights than men, and you think you can prove that from the Bible, they go, no, that violates love, which says we're all equal. Each one's rights are just as important. Slavery, you think you can prove that? No, that violates love. And so love becomes the guiding principle in determining whether an interpretation is right or wrong. Well, I hope that helped you. Such an important, complex topic, but one that was so important to think through. Let's pray. Father, again, I just pray that you would help each person in their journey as they think through their beliefs, their, their faith, 
what they're being told is true. Just help them in this journey, I pray. Amen. Well, that's another Friday night. Thank you for being with us.